uh, if you have your Bible, you can get it open to the book of James. I'm going to discuss for just a few minutes before we actually read it. But uh, let's see if I can get that tab open for you. Okay. Are you guys seeing my slide? Okay. I'll leave that up for a moment. Um, I want to I want to just start by making a couple of observations about uh, the book of James. Number one, I'm sure you're aware that there is no book in the Bible named James. It's not actually the guy's name. Now, why they decided to call this book James, nobody knows for sure. Um, some people suppose that the English translators of the King James Bible decided they wanted to put King James' name in there so that he would countenance the project and pay for it. <laughs> Who knows? Um, does anyone know what his name actually is? Tracy? Yaakov. Yeah. His name is Yaakov. It even says so in the Greek. <laughs> but... For the sake of discussion and for the sake of clarity, we're going to call him James, and I hope everybody will be okay with that. Now, a couple of, I want to lay the, the historical groundwork for just a couple of minutes because I think that this really helps us to see what the purpose of the book of James is. And I think once we discover a little bit of that, it will become so pertinent and so relevant to us in our lives. I, you know, I've talked to a couple of people uh, over the last couple of weeks, of, you know, that we're going to be starting this book, you know, study in the book of James, and they have said, wow, you're glutton for punishment, huh? You know, people, uh, they look at the book of James and they say, man, that's a, that's a tough book. It, it's hard on Christians. It, it really calls them on the mat and, and demands of them uh, certain behaviors. And I, I couldn't agree more, you know, it's really about how are you behaving yourself. And, but but it's, it's really about how do you behave yourself in the midst of difficulties. And I think once we look just a little bit and lay the groundwork of the historical context, you'll see that the, the, the time period in which this book was written and to whom it was written and for what purpose, it will become extremely relevant to us. And also very helpful and also very encouraging. So, number one, the book's author is James, and, or ya Yaakov, if you want to say that. He is very likely the half-brother of Yeshua, that most of the historical context does suggest that uh, the author was Yeshua's half-brother. I say half-brother because they shared a mother, but not a father. So... Uh, there's some evidence to suggest that, and I will I will point out to you, for example, uh, that you know if it was James, the half brother of Yeshua, it's likely that he did not actually become a believer in Yeshua until after Yeshua had died and was resurrected, uh, because in John five uh, seven and five, excuse me, he talks about how not even his brothers believed in him when he was you know, traveling through the region of Galilee and teaching. Uh, but then, if you look at 1 Corinthians, Paul is telling us that uh, you know, in, it, he gets some insight into who kind of saw the risen Lord uh, once he was raised from the dead. And it says here in 1 Corinthians 15, 5, that he appeared to Cephas, or Peter, and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Now that could be a reference to the half-brother James. It could also be a reference to um, James the apostle. But a lot of people think he's talking about uh, James the half-brother. And then if you look at... Um, there are a couple of other passages that I want to point to where, it, you know, in regards to the authority, this also goes back to who the author is. Uh, he, in Galatians 1, 18, Paul is relating his own 
uh, salvation journey and talks about how he saw the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. And then it says, then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see another one of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So he has been elevated, as you'll note, to the status, by Paul at least, of James the Apostle. Okay, so there's that. And then if you look at Galatians 2 and 9, it says that James and Peter and John, who were reported to be pillars of the community. And then if you look at Acts 15, 13, it says after they have this issue of what do we do with these Gentiles who are joining the, uh, the congregations of the Lord, where... He has to, they, they all present their case in a kind of a, a, a Christian version of the Sanhedrin, if you will. And everyone gets to say their piece. And then James, who is reported to be like the president of this messianic version of the Sanhedrin, stands up and says, brothers, listen to me. And he's basically making a final ruling. So... Not only is it likely that this is Yaakov, your James, the half-brother of Yeshua, but he is imbued with quite a bit of authority in the early church. He's likely the president of the local council that is in charge of making doctrinal decisions. And so his, his letter speaks with a good deal of authority. Any comments, questions, or concerns about this so far? Okay, now moving forward a little bit, I want to get into the, the date of authorship and why that's important. I did not actually realize this when I started to study this book, but this book was likely written between 40 and 55 AD, which incidentally is making it one of the very first writings of the New Testament. That's pretty early. And why that's important, and you can see this uh, in, in Josephus, the Antiquities, book 20 in chapter 9, it says that James was actually martyred, the brother of Yeshua was martyred in 62 AD, uh, and through some other contextual issues that are related to the text and the timeline of such things that scholars study, and I'm not a scholar by any stretch, but it, see, this is where they come up with the, the idea that uh, it was written between 40 and 55 AD, which would have been... 10 to 15 years after Yeshua was crucified and resurrected, which is not very long at all. Now, who is the audience? And I'm going to deal with this just briefly because in chapter 1, verses 2, verse 1 and 2, it starts to talk to identify who this book is written to. It says that it's written to the 12 tribes who are scattered abroad. Now, I want to, before, well, let me bring this up. No, I'm going to hold off on that thought. I apologize. Hebrews or Jews, it's not entirely clear. There's a bunch of confusion in the scholarship about who exactly this book is written to. Some people say it's Jewish Christians. Some say that he's calling out the 12 tribes uh, who are scattered abroad, but that he's using a euphemism and he doesn't literally mean the 12 tribes, I have no reason to think that he is not calling out the 12 tribes uh, deliberately. And I think that the reason, the reason why I think that will become clear in just a moment, but I'll tell you why I think that in, in, in a minute. Um, but I'll go into that a little bit deeper. Now, as to the purpose, okay, this is where it gets pretty serious, okay? Now, most Bible scholars... Um, most Bible scholars have this idea that James was written as a response to Paul. Now, I do not believe that that is true, A, because this was likely written before Paul wrote his letters, and B, this is the, this is the issue that we have a lot of times in, uh, in, in evangelical Protestant theology, and that is that Paul is given as like a plumb line. That all doctrine, even from Yeshua, from all, to all the other apostles, are judged according to a plumb line of Paul. 
Now, I don't have anything negative to say about Paul. I know there are some Hebrew Roots people who, who believe that Paul is, you know, the Antichrist or something, and I think that's silly because they have just gotten a misunderstanding of Paul. But unfortunately, Paul is seen as a plumb line, and, and every other gospel, every other letter, every other writing in the New Testament is, is basically judged against what did Paul say. And therefore, a lot of evangelical scholars believe that this book was written as a response to Paul because there were, they, they purport to say, and I don't see any evidence of this in, in my reading of the Bible, and you might, but I'd be, I'd be interested to hear it, that there's some kind of a disagreement about grace versus works, that somehow there was a great disagreement about grace versus works. Now, I don't actually see that, but that, that they believe that this book was written because Paul was a little too lax in being too gracious, and so James needed to write this letter to correct him and say, no, 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 you, you actually have to do some stuff in order to be saved. <clears throat> and there, of course, you know which chapter 2, verse so-and-so is talking about how faith without works is useless. Well, we're going to talk about that, <clears throat> but I don't see any daylight between Paul and James. I do not think that they disagree on anything. So I do not believe that this letter was likely, it was not likely written as a response to Paul. And I also don't see Paul as a plumb line. Paul is an, uh, an amazing author who was inspired by the Holy Spirit to give us tons and tons of truth. Uh, but I judge all things by what? What do I judge all things by? What do you judge all things by? Anyone? The Word of God. The Word of God, absolutely. Whether that is the words of God that were given to Moses or the words of God that were given and interpreted by the Messiah himself, Yeshua, the Messiah. He is the word of God. He knows the word of God. He is the word of God. And he explains the word of God better than anyone ever could. So I don't, I judge all doctrine if, if to see if it lines up with the Torah and the Messiah. If it does not, you can safely throw it out. But I think there's a good chance that everything I've read in my Bible, all of the authors who are included there, line up beautifully. Now, if people have a misunderstanding, that's their problem. But I want to say, Paul is not the plumb line. But unfortunately, he has an outsized influence among Gentile churches, Gentile congregations. But, that, you know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Tracy? As far as I Yeah. So if we want to understand Paul, we have to first become taught and stable in the Torah, in the foundation of the Messiah, and then those things fall right into line. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that's no question to me. There are certain writings by Paul that are very hard to understand. I can't claim to be able to explain to you every strange and difficult statement that Paul made. <laughs> I would not purport to say that. I know he's not wrong. I know he is an apostle of God and that he is right on with his theology. But there are some issues that, that, that uh, Paul brings up that just give a lot of people heartburn. I think he probably gave himself heartburn. But there you go. So the purpose of this book is not a, a refutation, a refutation, excuse me, of Paul. Now, looking at the historical context, and I, I think that this, this is a, a really good thing to look at. If you can look at, uh, you know, you, you know the, some of the stories about when Yeshua was born and how Herod was the king and how the Romans were occupying the Holy Land and how uh, these wise men came and, and, you know, Mary gave birth to Jesus and then Herod killed all these children uh, in, in and around Bethlehem and he had to flee to Egypt. And, uh, you know, this is a very turbulent period of time in the Holy Land. And it only gets worse. For a hundred 
and 35 to 40 years, we have absolute chaos in the land of Israel. You got the Romans occupying, we got the Messiah being born, that probably stirs up a whole bunch of issues and trouble. We got a corrupt priesthood, we got lots of wars and famines and Jews being massacred and Jews who are very politically, uh, I don't want to say inspired, but maybe I do. Politics is embroiling everyone during this time. There are seditious Jews who form cliques of Sicarii and assassins and factions and, uh, they want to, some want to fight the Romans. Some are trying to be humble and say that, you know, God put them over us. So, you know, we got to be humble and we got to submit. But this is a very, very difficult time to be alive in the Holy Land. This is not a place of peace. There is guerrilla warfare. There's absolute political chaos. There's poverty. There's persecution, both from Jews, from unbelieving Jews, as well as Romans. Uh, it, <clears throat> Idumeans, the Edomites, are also persecuting people. We've got famines, and, and you can, if you want to take a look at some very interesting stuff, I recommend that you take a look at Josephus in his writings, The Wars of the Jews. Uh, that's a free online book that you can read anywhere. It's called The Wars of the Jews by Josephus, and it's all about this whole time period from probably about the time that Yeshua was born until... Um, the just before the end of the final rebellion where you know where they actually the Romans destroyed the temple killed like a million people ex you know exiled all the others it was it was a horrific horrific time and that is the context of the book of James what you know that What's going on in the world around you really influences not only the way you see things that are happening, but also the things that you talk about, the things that are concerning you, the things that you need prayer for, the things that you are hearing from other people and, and pondering and talking about in your fellowships and talking about and praying for one another. These things are very serious and it's absolute chaos out there in the world of James. And I believe that that is the primary purpose of, of this writing <clears throat> is to encourage people and especially, <clears throat> most especially to help them behave appropriately in the midst of crazy, dangerous circumstances. And so, knowing, as I do, that we are living in a world that is crazy and stupid and persecution, very, very minor persecution at this point, but also lots of political chaos, uh, is definitely shaking people. And that's why I think that as we get through this book, you'll note how really relevant it is for us. Make sense? Any questions so far about that? Okay. I want to bring to your attention a couple of, couple of, uh, a couple of points before we actually break open the book and begin to read. Number one, I personally believe the purpose primarily is practical wisdom for living in turbulent times. And number two, I would say as you continue to read this, and I've mentioned to you this on many, I've mentioned this to you on many an occasion that in your notes for study, continuously ask yourself questions of the text as you're reading. I, I can't hardly get through a sentence or two in this reading without stopping and thinking, why did he say that? Who is he talking to? What is he talking about? There, there are so many questions that need answering. And I just want to always encourage you as you're reading your scriptures to ask lots of questions. I don't know whether you'll find the answers to those questions, but pray by the Spirit of God that He will grant you wisdom and discernment and, and insight to see what these things mean. Seek out those answers. 
uh, by the Holy Spirit by word meanings. What does this word mean in the text? Where is it used in the uh, in the Old Testament? How can we look at the the meaning of this word as it has as as uh, morphed over time? And how did they use it in the Old Testament? How did they use it in the New? Those will be very informative. And also that key thing that we always look for, where have we heard this before? Whenever you see something that you have heard before, do a phrase search. You'll find it and it'll bring really new and interesting things to your, to, to your vision. Uh, so that's what I have as prelude to the book of James. And now I'm going to begin reading. It's story time. Put on your pajamas. It's story time with Uncle Alan. Here we go. You guys ready? James, who, is someone talking? Who wants to talk? No, I was just saying, I was just saying, we're ready. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, here comes story time. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Yeshua the Messiah, to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that person ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now the brother or sister of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, but the rich person is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass and its flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So also the rich person in the midst of his pursuits will die out. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. No one is to say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then, when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it has run its course, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers and sisters. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. You know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Now everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For a man's anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not just hearers who deceive themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and walked away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who has looked per intently at the perfect law, the law of freedom, and has continued in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an actual doer, this person will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this person's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit widows and orphans in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. 
And there it is, ladies and gentlemen. That is chapter one of James. Now, let's go through it with a fine-tooth comb and see what we can find. I want to bring your attention, first of all, to the introduction, where it says, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know that you know that a bondservant is doulos in the Greek, but I also want you to know that in the in the in this context, I it's we in in the West, especially in America and and in the West, we we have a concept of slavery, which I don't think is in view here. This is, as you can see on my notes here, I put that that the the second definition is probably more ap apropos in this area, where it's really about one who gives himself up to another's will. Now, I have, I have mentioned before, this is years ago, that, for example, like if you're, if you're a career military guy, just, to, you know, not high up on the totem pole, not responsible for making decisions that are going to be uh, involving the lives of the soldiers who serve under you, but just your standard enlisted guy who is serving someone else. You know, they tell you when to get up. They tell you when to go down. They tell you when to jump, how high to jump, where to shoot. They tell you exactly everything to do. And so, in a sense, there's a certain freedom in having a master whose will is elevated above yours that you see as an authority figure and you do everything they tell you to do. You don't have to make decisions for yourself. In fact, you should not make decision, decisions for yourself. You follow orders and that's it. Can you see how that would be kind of a peaceful life <laughs> where someone else is taking care of your every need making decisions for you, for your benefit and for the benefit of everyone around you. Now that would be hard to find in the military probably because we're dealing with humans here and it's certainly impossible to find in a government, for example, who's trying to make decisions for people like a socialist or a communist society where we're supposed <laughs> to all be serving each other and we're subservient to everyone. That almost never works out in real life. But from God's perspective, from the Messiah's perspective, that does work out, and it works out very well. And I think this is the overarching theme that we need to keep in mind at all times. I don't actually have a will of my own, and neither do you. We serve someone else. His will is more important than ours in every circumstance at all times. Now, unfortunately, he's not going to tell you which pant leg to put on first. You're going to have to make some decisions on your own. But any decision of, of any real import, anything that's important, I believe he is going to give you guidance in his word or he may actually give you guidance through providence. You may even hear his voice or receive a dream from him to help you to make difficult decisions. But I want to impress upon you the importance of the way James sees himself as a doulos, someone who has submitted his will to someone else. He does not make decisions for himself. He serves God and the Messiah. He sticks them together because he sees them as co-equal. God and the Messiah Yeshua are one and the same. There is no daylight between Yeshua and the Father. But he always, Yeshua himself always submitted himself to the will of the Father in every, in every circumstance. That's a great example to look to is Yeshua. And to a lesser degree, James himself, being a total bondservant 
of God and the Messiah Yeshua. So that's the first thing that I would point out to you. Yes, ma'am. Angela wanted to point out something. Go ahead, Angela. That works really well if you absolutely trust that person who's in charge. And I think we might be getting to, uh, if you don't trust, if you don't have faith, if you have doubts in that person who's in charge, then you are on really unstable ground. Because if you don't trust the person that you're, that's like your commander, mm -hmm. then that's a really scary place to be. Did you guys hear Angela's comment? Excellent. That was a delightful comment. Thank you, Angela. Uh, th that is absolutely correct. You have to be able to trust the one who is helping you and guiding you and providing you guidance. Uh, and that comes with experience, doesn't it? Those of you who have been f walking with the Lord for any length of time, I mean, even if you're a brand new believer and you're coming to know the Lord, you have this strong sense that you can trust Him and that He loves you. I mean, that people have been talking about how God is love and He only wants the best for you. That's just common knowledge. Everyone in the world seems to know that. If they're willing to admit God at all, that would, that would generally be how they would characterize Him. But knowing that experientially, that's a different thing. That is a different thing. You can, you can know that God is love and know that God is going to help you and know that He cares about you and know that He's concerned about even the smallest details in your life and that He wants to guide you on the, pro, on the appropriate path. But if you don't have experience in that, it can be a little more challenging. Yeah. Angela? And that's what you see in the wilderness is that they may have known it in their head, but when they went to experience, because all those times that they tested God in the wilderness, it was about provision and protection, and they didn't really trust him to do that. And mm -hmm. so they were like, uh, they were unstable. Yeah, unstable. They were unstable. And you're going to see this, this theme of instability and being like water and being tossed around to and fro. I mean, this whole first chapter is dealing with this, this same subject, but it, it really needs to be hammered out, uh, is that you've got to experientially know him. But you have to start somewhere. And starting with, I absolutely trust him. I absolutely trust him. I absolutely trust him. Even though I don't have that experience yet, if you're a new believer, I really, really, really trust him. I know it's going to be okay. And, and you know, we'll, we'll get to a little bit more of that in just a moment. But I think that's a critical place to start is, uh, you know, James is a servant. Now, this just brings me to a couple of points that I want to make. And this is, as you can see on your screen here, who are you serving and how are you serving? Now, what this means to me is you need to be considering who are you serving? Unfortunately, a lot of us are serving ourselves. I include myself in that. I'm not any better than you. And I know you guys, you're not better than me. <laughs> we are a lot of times serving ourselves. That is our natural default position. We are born serving ourselves and it takes a long time to learn to not serve ourselves. We're always looking out for number one. Our culture trains us to look out for number one. And it just comes naturally to look out for number one. But I want to encourage you to really look at your heart, your motivations, and the things that you do and the, how you go about doing the things that you do. Who are you serving? And now you ask yourself, well, how do I serve God? That's a great question. And I have divided it up into duties to God and duties to others. And, and, and strangely and interestingly, they're the same thing. Duties to God are duties to others. They're the same thing. However, there are a couple of things that are specifically duties to God. And I think that this is where you start to draw some distinctions between 
Hebrew Roots Fellowships and other types of fellowships. This is where you kind of get into religious rituals that are vertical, where we feel like we're serving God. What do, I, what do you think of when I say to you, how do you serve God? Now leave aside for just a moment, serving others is serving God, and to the, you know, to the degree that you did this to the least of my servants, you did it to me. We'll deal with that in a moment. But when you think about that purely vertical service to God, what do you think of? Tracy? Whatever he says to you, do it. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, I, I, I think those are, those are good points, Mikey. I would agree with you 100%. Um, this is where the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath day, is a worship of God directly between you and Him. Observing the feast days is, is vertical. Um, that kind of stuff. Anybody else? Yeah. And that's pretty difficult. It is. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's a good insight. And I was going to, uh, you know, some, uh, I think it was Tracy or Mike, one or the other, mentioned uh, briefly the idea of connecting with God vertically. And that happens uh, through prayer and through reading the Word of God. It also happens when you are studying, <clears throat> like we are now. I think this is a vertical service to God. We are sharpening each other, and we are sharing His Word among us, but we are also, this is a vertical service, I think. Daryl, did you want to say something? Well, I just, you know, I think it's really important, too, about the obedience thing. Um, knowing what His commandments are, and then having the desire live those out because you want to be obedient to him because of your respect and your love for who he is to me that is critical in serving God that should be definitely one of the first things we're aware of mm -hmm. as we are on this journey to serve him yes absolutely and Alan, I, I would say that what Daryl just pointed out goes back to what you talked about just before this in the head knowledge and James and John and Peter and Yeshua, they make statements all over the place that indicate belief is obedience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, it, that it's not just in our head, but it's in our, our action. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, those two things are synonymous, and I know that that gives a lot of theological problems <clears throat> to some people because it's unfortunate, you know, that in our modern church culture, a lot of emphasis is placed on having correct doctrine and having correct opinion and a correct interpretation of the Bible and believing as, as, as far as holding correct, holding correct interpretations, holding co uh, correct doctrines, believing the correct thing. I mean, there's no question to me that believing the correct thing is important. You have to have, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, is what the text says. You have to have the truth. But you can't just have the truth. Because knowledge without action is useless. If you know how to do something to save someone's life, you know CPR, and someone's choking and dying in front of you, and you say, it's okay, I know how to fix this, but you don't do anything, they're going to die. Is that putting wisdom ahead of love? That's putting wisdom ahead of love, Angela says. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So those are vertical service that are super critical, very, very critical. And I think that to the degree that the, the modern church is failing 
it is in the vertical services to God. Now, I do know that services to others, you know, loving your neighbor, this is where the church, this is where they generally excel. And I know that some people will say, well, that's, more, probably more important than service to God. And I think that there's a, there's a good case to be made that loving one another is super, super critical. Am I willing to elevate loving one another to the same level or even above being obedient to God in the sense of those verticals? I don't know that I would. I don't know that I would. I know that they are super critical, and I think that loving each other and your duties to others around you is super, super critical, but I don't know that you can place one above the other. Tracy? You cannot properly know how to love one another without first loving God, and that's why it's the second commandment. First and greatest is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, and you can't love the Lord your God with all your heart unless you trust Him mm -hmm. and fear Him or revere Him. Mm -hmm. And you can't obey him unless you trust him or fear or revere him. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. that's what, I think I mentioned this before, like even in our, um, in our earthly jobs and things like that, where, you know, someone's giving you a command you have to do, you have the choice of obeying or not obeying. Yeah. And the only reason why you wouldn't obey or do it is you didn't trust the advice of the person or you didn't have any respect for that person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why God's the thing, fear me. Revere me, trust yeah. me. He, yeah. and he knows is the plan he has for us, and he has good intentions for us. We just have to believe that and do it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Very, very good insights, you guys. So I think it just, we, we need to be bond servants. I would like very much for people to be able to look at me and say, you know, Alan was a real servant. He tried to serve God and he served people around him. I would love if, would you just go ahead and, you know, just to humor me when I die, would you just go ahead and tell everybody he that? And I'm just telling Angela, when I die, just make sure you tell everybody, Alan was a great bond servant. <laughs> now, I want to be a bond servant. I want to be characterized as a bond servant. I want to serve others. Uh, a lot of times I'm serving myself though. And that is so hard. It is so hard to put myself aside because that is the battle that I do with my flesh every day. And I, and I think that one of the biggest battles that we have with our flesh is with our intellect. Our intellect, elevating our own intellect, the things that we think we know. That's a hard one. That's a really hard one for me at least. Now, I just want to spend a moment briefly talking about how are we serving each other. And I think this differs for males and females and home and out in the world, and our brethren, and our families, and our friends, and our societies as a whole. And I think that James is going to deal with this a little bit, and I've also got some scriptures, which I want to show you in a moment, that I think will touch on this a little bit more broadly. But I think um, that if you are a man, and you're not retired, you have a... your service to people around you. How, well, I don't want to tell you. I want you to tell me. Who wants to tell me? A, a married man who is not retired, what is his, what is his primary function? What would you say? Don't, don't be shy. To provide. To provide. Yes. That's essentially it in a nutshell. And protect. To provide and protect. Angela says protect. It's a great insight. Anyone else? Sharing wisdom. Sharing wisdom, teaching, absolutely. Being a spiritual leader in the home, absolutely. Anything else? Also a spiritual leader to younger men. Absolutely, absolutely. Daryl? Yes, I think it's important to be aware of your surroundings so that if, of course, your family comes first, but other individuals in the community, in your job, in the church you go to, whatever, 
when you see the needs of other people that you know you can help them in some way or be of service to them, maybe you have things you can do that they can't for mm -hmm. them. Yeah. It's being aware of those things to, to consciously help other people. Yeah, absolutely. Good insight. I think, um, Tracy, go ahead. Yeah. Really falls on the, the male of the house because it's like you know like the, the scriptural analogy of being like the sun mm -hmm. and the moon and the, the children reflect the sun mm -hmm. the light of the sun the same way that if you know the husband is acting a certain way then the family will reflect that. Yeah, I think that's a great great insight, and I would say. Um, a couple of things, you know, from my own perspective on this would be, number one, men these days have become weak, very weak and ineffectual. Um, I don't know exactly what it is. I don't know why it is. I have some ideas and I don't necessarily think I'm going to share those with you, but, uh, you know, why do you think it is that women are rising up above men and are in positions of authority in so many institutions now. It's part, partly because I think, unfortunately, we can see that that challenge to a man's authority is innately going to come from a woman because that is, I believe personally, that's part of the curse, that her desire is for her husband. I don't think that is a desire that is to overturn her husband and usurp him because he's adult in a lot of cases and he needs guidance and wisdom. And a woman can sometimes attempt to elevate herself over a man. But I think that unfortunately, the reason she does that is because her man is not standing up. A woman's natural desire, if she sees something wrong, is to stand up and fix it. And if a man is not gonna stand up and fix it, she'll do it for you. But then unfortunately, you bring shame to yourself. And I'm thinking of Deborah and Barack in this instance where she says, yeah, I can go out and get this victory for you, but it's not going to look good for you. You're going to look like a sissy. I'm going to get the glory. A woman is going to get the glory in, for, defeating the Israel's, to, to, for defeating Israel's enemies. God's going to give us the victory. But do you want to be a man and man up and do what you're supposed to do? Or do you want me to take, do you want me to take the glory? That's, and I think that that was a judgment. I think that was a judgment. But, but unfortunately, we, and I don't, I am not the kind of person who would say that a woman should be in the home and barefoot and pregnant. That is not my position at all. I, I, I love strong women who are capable and, and fierce and, and, and active. But a man needs to, to do his job of providing for his family and protecting his family. This is, the, this is the issue that we saw right at the first in the garden of a man not protecting his family. This is where he failed initially, and I think it was unfortunately a pattern that was set that he was not able to protect and defend his family. And unfortunately, I think sometimes we can take that too far and think, well, a man needs to be a provider for his family. He certainly does. But I've said to you guys before, and I'll say it a hundred times more, if your wife can replace you with a paycheck, you're not a husband. You're a paycheck. And a lot of men will work really hard and provide money for their families, but nothing else. They're not available to do anything else. There is a need for money, but there's also a need for spiritual leadership. And I don't think necessarily that the woman should be taking over all of the child rearing duties. That's a, that's a joint partnership. You've got to make time to raise your kids uh, as well. Now that becomes hard. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to work a full-time job and then come home and still have some time left over to be a good husband to your wife and be a good father to your children, that ain't easy. And I'll just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand on this soapbox for just another like 30 seconds and then I'll get off it and kick it to the side, I promise. Um, 
I see sometimes where people are like, you know, I really want to serve God. I, I want to do something for his kingdom. I want to serve people around me. And I think that's fabulous. <sighs> but if you're not serving your family first, you got no business serving someone else. You've got no business. You're of no use. Why do you think that Paul tells Timothy, hey, look, man, if you're going to put somebody in a position of authority or leadership at all in the church, and they're going to start serving others, what are the, what are the qualifications? He's got to be the master of his own house with well-behaved children. He's got to have a good reputation in the community. There's a whole list of things there. And, and here's the thing. The house is orderly. The children are well-behaved. They're fed. They're clothed. The, the home unit is running well. Now, do you know how many home units are not running well? <coughs> and the husband and the wife are out doing ministry. Angela likes to say that you're tripping over the people who are desperately in need looking for someone to serve. I'll repeat that. You are tripping over the people who are desperately right, in need. need looking for someone to serve. That's a bad place to be. Angela? That's when you're serving yourself. That's when you're serving yourself. That's a tricky one because you can get out there and try and serve people and feel like you're serving people, but you're really serving yourself. Maybe it's because you want to feel good about yourself. Maybe it's because you want to feel good about what you're doing. And I think you should feel good about what you're doing if you're doing the right thing. But remember that it all starts in the home. If your home is not in order, don't leave it. That's my, that's my perspective. If your home is not in order, don't leave it. Do not move outside the home until and unless your home is in order. Because if your home is in order, you are a light in the world. You are shining as an example for other men around you. Your wife is shining as an example for other women around you. Your children are shining as an example for other children around them. It starts right there in the home. So that's what it means to me to be a bond servant, to be beholden to the desire of another. And that we know from all kinds of scripture is the hierarchy of service. I'm serving God. God has instructed me to serve my family. If I have the strength of character and the, and the wisdom to get my family in order, then he says, if you are faithful, with the little bit, I'll give you more. Is, is that a correct? Is that a correct statement? Is, am I correct on my theology there? I see a few heads nodding. All right, I'll take it. Sorry, jumping down off the soapbox. Moving forward. Comments, questions, or concerns? Yes, Tracy. <laughs> what I wanted to point out is um, that this idea, even in the Christian church, it's been it's just really unfortunate that the husband is like this, you know, ruler and the wife must fall in line and she shouldn't speak and this idea of, you know, being subservient. This was a result of the fall. Mm -hmm. This was part of the curse. From the beginning, it was not so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So our desire is to get back to the beginning. Right. And I think that part of what we're seeing is women pushing back against the thumb that's being pushed down on them. Agreed. That's not good either. Right. But that's the thing is like if we were to go back to how it was made, meant to be in the beginning and look at those relationships and how God created them to work together. Yeah. And that's the that's what it, what it should look like. And then we again are told what it should look like from Messiah's perspective. Mm -hmm. Husbands love your wives as Messiah loved the ecclesia, the mm -hmm. called out ones, the mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know how to be a good father or father and husband, you got to look to the and how long that's, that's the perfect model. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, Angela, go ahead. 
it's become a power struggle instead of working as a team. Yeah. And, and that is, uh, you know, I have, I have done uh, a fair amount of relationship and marriage counseling over the years. And I can tell you that that is, that is the huge problem in marriages is fighting for control. That's always the problem. Everyone is more concerned about their needs because everyone is so concerned about their needs and how maybe their needs aren't getting met. It's we're just going around in this circle of you're not giving me what I need, so I'm not giving you what you need, and we're just cutting off each other's noses despite our faces. And we're that's all serving the, ourselves. What's that? We're all serving ourselves. We're all serving ourselves. It, it's it's really hard to not serve yourselves, man. It's really hard, but I want to encourage us to continue to learn how to do it. And this book, I think, is going to help us at least a little bit. Uh, I'm going to move forward just a little bit here. Uh, the 12 tribes. Now, the next little section that comes up here is him saying that this book is written to the 12 tribes. Now, do we have, I mean, we don't, we don't really have, is this metaphorical? Is this literal? Is he literally talking about the 12 tribes? I mean, where were the 12 tribes during the time that this was written? And um, I, I don't think that anyone is going to definitively be able to answer that question. I don't have any reason to believe that he is not literally referencing the 12 tribes themselves. Um, I mean, we know that there are a lot of what the world in general, and I think this is kind of just what happens even today, is that if you serve God in a certain way, uh, people will lump you into a category. And I think that if you served this one God of the Jews back in those days, you were just considered a Jew. And I think that you, and we can see that in the, in the book of Acts, for example, we see have, we have several people identified as being from the tribe of Simeon or from the tribe of Benjamin or from the tribe of Levi. And I'm not suggesting to you that they knew in those days where all 12 tribes were, but certain people did identify themselves as belonging to tribes other than Judah. So they were not all Jews. Just in the same way that people might look at you and the way you worship and the way you do things and say, oh, well, you must be Jewish or you're just doing Jewish things. It's like, no, I'm not a Jew and I'm not doing Jewish things. I'm doing biblical things and it just looks like Jewish because unfortunately Jews are the only ones doing certain of these things and you're just confused. But I think that this is James identifying for us that he's talking to all the people of God and not just Jews who are scattered around. Okay. And I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go so far as to say, you know, this is about two house thing. And if you're a Christian, then you must secretly belong to one of the 12 tribes. That is certainly possible, but you could never prove that. But it's not about that. It's not about a bloodline identity. It's about who are you relating to spiritually that's really what it's all about. And you become grafted in and I don't, you can go in any one of those gates in the new Jerusalem and you can, you know, go settle in whatever piece of property in the Holy land in the kingdom that you want to and call yourself by whatever tribe. It don't matter. You are, you are a child of God and you are grafted in and you can call yourself a Hebrew. You can call yourself an Israelite. You can call yourself whatever you want, but you are a member of God's family. If you want to identify as one of the 12 tribes, great. You're going to eventually. I assume so. You're going to go into one of those gates. You're going to settle somewhere in the land of Israel. I don't believe that those uh, borders and, and places that he laid out on the map and saying this part belongs to Judah and this part belongs to Nebula, uh, you know, Naphtali and Zebulon. Well, if you go and live there, you might be called a, a Zebulonite. Doesn't matter point is, I think he is identifying all 12 tribes. And the reason I think that this is important is because he's going to identify one other thing that I think is going to immediately make their ears perk up. And, and what I want to point out here is this. Um, where are these tribes? Well, we know that there are a lot of Jews and some from other tribes living in the land of Israel. We know that there are a whole bunch of Jews or people from the other tribes who were living in the lands of uh, Babylon or even 
what would currently be modern Iran, Persia. Um, we know that some of those northern 10 tribes got exiled w possibly way up north by what is now Pakistan or, you know, Romania. Who knows where they went? But there are Jews and quote unquote Israelites all over the, the known world at this point. And this letter is being written to all of them. And I think you want to also remember that historically speaking, this is primarily a Jewish religion at this time. There are some Gentiles in 40 to 55 AD. There are some Gentiles. The Gentile congregations, the, the believers who are Gentiles, who are joining themselves to this organization, there are a, a good amount of them probably. But I, I think that it's from the book of Acts, you can see that uh, it's a lot, it's a bunch of Jews. It's a bunch of Jews who are believing in the Messiah. And there are Gentiles coming in and we're, we're burgeoning, we're, we're, you know, busting out of the seams, people growing into this fellowship. Now, here's the next point that I want to make to you. These are 12 tribes in the dispersion. This is critical language. This is not telling us this is not telling us that these are groups of people that are just flung out across the world. What is this going to mean to the mind of the reader? When the reader reads, oh, this is to the Jews, the 12 tribes of the dispersion, what does that mean? Oh, that just means that we're scattered? What is that going to mean to them? Because I think critical thing that you have to think about whenever you're reading the Bible is what did the author mean when he said it and what did the people who read it at that time think he meant when he read it? Because I think that this is where a lot of confusion comes in in the modern world regarding the Bible. We're not exactly sure what the author meant and we're definitely not sure what the other readers who would have read it thought he meant. If we can place ourselves into their shoes and see the world from their eyes and from their perspective by just immersing ourselves a little bit into their world and what they, how they would have seen it, man, our vision of these things can become a lot clearer. So think to yourself, James, the brother of Yeshua, is, the, is writing this letter to all of these people who identify as Hebrews or 12 tribes or whatever, and he says, you are in the dispersion. What do they think of when they say diaspora? Okay, what, now that's the Greek word, diaspora. Does anyone know the Hebrew word that would be an equivalent to the Greek word diaspora? Anyone? Okay. The, the Hebrew word is geula. Exile. 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 Now, if that doesn't make your ears perk up a little bit, are your ears, I can't hardly see your ears. Are they perking up? Yes, yes. Mike's ears are perking up a little bit there. When, when, I, Cheryl's showing us her ears. Look, nice looking ears, Cheryl. Uh, what, what do you think of when I say, hey, I'm writing this letter to the 12 tribes who are in exile? What are you thinking of? Babylon. Babylon, yes. I am thinking of Babylon. What else am I thinking of? Exodus. Yeah, absolutely. I, this should bring to the mind of the reader a whole host of things. Number one, the ten tribes who were sent into exile in Assyria, by the Assyrians. The other two and a half or three tribes who were sent into exile by the Babylonians. And frankly, in just a few years from the time that this book was written, he's going to send... Jews. The Jews, again, into a very extended exile, which they are still in. You know what? They are still in exile. Angela, would you like to say something? 
It makes me think, like right here at the beginning of this letter, he's saying, I haven't forgotten you. That's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. Tracy? So I cross-referenced this word, the Greek word for um, dispersion with the um, Greek Septuagint in the Old Testament, and I found a, a scripture that I thought was pretty interesting and relevant. Share it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, uh, as you just said, and as Angela just pointed out, I think that this is James reminding these people of a couple of things. Remember why you were in exile in the first place. Let's not make sure, let's make sure that we don't prolong our stay in exile by behaving inappropriately while we're in exile. And let's make sure that we remember that he is coming to regather us again. And I think that there's a great case to be made for the whole gospel message in the whole New Testament. What this is about is a spiritual regathering, not a physical regathering. Okay, that this whole message is going out to all of the dispersed tribes and anyone who wants to join in. This is a spiritual regathering, that we are regathering ourselves spiritually. You know, I, I think you want to consider for us, for the sake of discussion, a, a, a certain scenario like you, you know, you've got a wayward and difficult child, for example, and you desperately want to bring him or her back into the fold of the family, but they're making dumb decisions or, you know, whatever. You want them to rejoin the family, but you also need to give them an opportunity to demonstrate that they understand the way that the family works and that they're gonna behave themselves. And only then can they be brought in. The invitation to come and rejoin the family is always there, but we need to see genuine repentance and we need to see a heart that is willing to rejoin this family. And I think that that is what the last 2,000 years has been about, is he is looking for a people who are willing to turn their hearts back to him and spiritually connect with him. And then the physical promise of a physical regathering will occur in the perhaps not too distant future. But we need to remind ourselves, and I think that these people having immediately in the first sentence of this letter, are identifying themselves, oh, he's talking to us for sure, and oh gosh, he's telling us we're dispersed. He's reminding us of our dispersion. Why are they dispersed? How should they behave while they are dispersed? We talked a little bit, Tracy gave us a, a wonderful uh, passage there from the prophet regarding why they were dispersed. And there's a whole slew of reasons, which is idolatry, unfaithfulness, breaking his covenant, violating his Sabbath, treating your brothers and sisters with wickedness. There's a whole slew of reasons why they were dispersed. The key here is, and I think that this is what James is going to really be hammering home as we are out here in the world and dealing with difficult situations, difficult people, being in exile. Uh, this is the part that I want you to pay special attention to. How should they behave while they're out there dealing with this? And here I've brought forward Jeremiah 29. I want to bring this to your attention, and I brought this to your attention not too long ago. It says, This is what Yuvah Zavaot, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. You can think yourself there. You can pop, plug yourself right in. Build houses and live in them and plant gardens and eat their produce. 
Take wives and fathers sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, so that they may give birth to sons and daughters, and grow in number there, and do not decrease. Seek the prosperity of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to Yuvah in its behalf, for in its prosperity will be your prosperity. This is the, this is the path to how to behave yourself in exile. You have to get along. You have to be an example. And there are so many, Paul talks about this on multiple occasions and says, you know, don't give any reason for the people around you to cast dispersions at you. Behave yourself in a fashion that is worthy of the calling with which you've been called. In fact, I brought another one here. This is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. It says, aspire to live quietly and to mind your own business and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Those are critical verses about how you are supposed to conduct yourself when you are in exile. And I think, unfortunately, the church does not have a proper perspective on being in exile. You are in exile. I know that in the West, especially here in America, we have this idea that we're a city shining on a hill and we're like the new Jerusalem in the new land of Israel and we are this wonderful gemstone of a place on the planet. You know, that might have been about 350 years ago. That is not the case now. You ain't living in the new Jerusalem. You're living in Babylon. We are in exile as Christians, as Jews, Whatever tribe you're from, whatever religion you think you're from, if you're from the Judeo-Christian religion of some kind, you are living in exile. And you have to comport yourself, behave yourself in a certain way while you're in exile. And here's something that I want to point out to you. You have a couple of duties. Repent. And do the things that he told you to do. That's number one. Repent and turn to him with all your heart and do the things that he told you to do from the get-go. Number two, you lost the privilege of doing this the easy way. Living amongst the people who are fervent for God in a land that is completely controlled by God and his priests and his kings and the prophets, and having a bunch of people around you who are all of a like mind and a like kind, you lost that privilege. It does not belong to you anymore. Now, this is the real test of your faith, and you should consider it all joy when you encounter these various testings and temptations of your faith. You have to do it while in the midst of a people who is not doing it. And you have to try, and they're trying to pull you away from doing it. Your job is much harder now, but it's so much more critical. And this is the real test. This is the real test. And, and you know, I want to tell you that this is the power of the Spirit of God in, the, in whatever degree it is actually working in our day and has been for the last 2,000 years, that the people of Israel could not get it together when they had it together. Let me rephrase that. No, I'm not going to rephrase that. I'm going to restate that. They couldn't get it together when they had it together. They were all together and could have been of like mind and like kind doing the things that they should have done, but they did not do it. And now I'm not suggesting that we're really doing it much better, but maybe just a little bit if we can be faithful in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation scattered as we are in exile, this is the true test. We lost the privilege of doing it as a group, as a nation, and now we have to do it as individuals and family units and small faith congregations. Should we be fighting against the system? No, we should not. We should be humble and we should be servants of the system. You don't want to fight this system. I'll remind you to read the book of Jeremiah from right there where we started all the way through chapter 40. Immediately after this section that I just read to you, there were false prophets coming in and saying, no, Jeremiah is wrong. 
We're not going to stay here and serve Babylon. We're going to flee. We're going to fight. And you know what God said? We are going, you just try it. You just try it. I will destroy you by war, by pestilence, by famine, plague, whatever. Angelo? Oh, yes, thank you. The, no, don't do that. And I want to just bring to your attention here a couple of examples of, and we have, we have excellent examples. We must obey our masters as far as we can, as much as it depends upon us to be at peace. Here are our examples. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Esther, and Mordecai, and the Maccabees. Now, those are very different examples, but I just want to run through them briefly for you. Number one, Daniel. You know what he did? He was confronted with a trial, a difficulty brought upon him from the outside. Behave in a certain way, Daniel. And he said, oh, I can't do that. Can I get an accommodation? Could we try this? Could I not eat the king's meat and eat the king's wine because it's probably been sacrificed to an idol and I don't want to defile myself in that way? Could I eat vegetables and drink water instead? And then let's do a test for 10 days and see if I'm healthy and fat and strong looking from eating my water and vegetables just as strong as you people over there. What's he trying to do? He's seeking accommodation. It's, is it, is it, could he have said, oh, we know that there's no gods in the world. We know that there's no such thing as a God in the world and meat sacrificed to idols. Eh, who cares? He cared. And he also probably knew that his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego cared. So he probably thought to himself, you know what? I know that there's no such thing as a God in the world and I could totally eat this stuff that's sacrificed to an idol, but I've got friends who that might damage their tender conscience. And so I'm not going to eat it. I'm going to eat vegetables and water. And he sought for accommodation. There's an example. When you can seek for accommodation in the world and the society that you live in, seek peace. Seek accommodation. Do what you can to get along. But then you go to the next example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because then they're telling you bow down. That we cannot do. When the government or the society around you says you must do what God tells you not to do, then you can fight. They don't even have to fight. You can just say, kill me. If you want, you can kill me. That's great. If you tell me I must do what God says not to, or you tell me I cannot do what God tells me I must do, you can kill me. Now, Esther and Mordecai, they obeyed and served the Persian king and became leaders in the government and influenced the government for good. You live in a unique society in the history of the world where you get an opportunity to vote for people that you can find that might be righteous. If there aren't any people who are righteous, then don't vote. <laughs> I'm not necessarily saying choose the lesser of two evils. Just, get, just opt out. But if there's a righteous individual that is willing to obey the laws of God to whatever degree that you possibly can, vote for them. You have such an amazing... I mean, you, you got people in the history of the world that are living under absolute tyranny. Dictators. Theocracies of an evil sort. And those people submitted to those people as best they could. And then the final example is the Maccabees. Now, this is where it's time to fight and die because they didn't care what you were going to do. If, they, if you didn't do what they wanted you to do, they would just kill you. And they were just enjoying killing you and they were delighting in killing as many of you as they possibly could. Well, there's a time to lay down your life and there's a time to stand up and fight. Mordecai and Esther and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and Daniel said, I'll get along as well as I can. I'll say, kill me if you want to when the time is right. Or... You're just going to slaughter us all? Well, my God tells me to preserve life. So if you're only interested in slaughter and just killing the people of God, huh, I may want to fight. Tracy? Um, oh, I was going to go back to something you said. Please. Um, uh, regarding um, what we're doing. I don't know I've said this before, but our example going back to 
to the Exodus, and then they were, he, they were in the wilderness, and the test was whether they were going to put their trust in God or not. Mm-hmm. And um, in Exodus 6 is when uh, the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. That word rate is devar in Hebrew, which is words. So they're going to go out and gather a certain word every day, metaphorically. Mm-hmm. Then I may prove them, or approve them, whether they will walk in my Torah or not. And our uh, manna from heaven, the true bread from heaven, is Messiah. And he came for the same reason, mm-hmm. to try us and test us, that he may prove us whether we will walk in his Torah or not. It is no different for them. He's not a partiality. It's not show partiality with people. Right. And then this, this tied back to what we read in James. Blessed is the man who endures temptation because having been approved or proved, he'll receive the crown of life mm-hmm. to which the Lord promises the one loving him. Mm-hmm. So I just thought that all kind of tied together with what you're saying about what we're supposed to be doing in the dispersion. That gathering a certain rate, that certain word every day, that's what Messiah said, give us this day our daily bread. Yep. So that's what we're supposed to be doing is taking in this word daily, just like they did from the Messiah, through the Messiah. Yeah. And the test is, are we going to do, are we going to do it now? Because like you were saying, it's like, are you going to, I'm going to give you an opportunity to prove that you want to be in this family. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And I say we need to take this opportunity. The time is short and we really need to get serious about being a part of this family and doing everything that we can. Um, I want to, I want to just, I'm going to go ahead and stop right there because I know it's, it's getting a little bit later. Um, but Can I yes, please, Angela, go ahead. Tracy was just talking about verse 12, and I wanted to, to add something to that. Mm-hmm. Um, you had talked about Daniel, who was uh, put, he had that test for 10 days. Mm-hmm. He and his friends said, give us 10 days to eat the vegetables and the water, and we'll see how we're doing. And then later you had uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were literally proved through fire like gold, refined, um, and they were faithful unto death. And if you compare James 1.12 to Revelation 2.10, um, I'm going to, can I read both? Please, yes, please okay. read it. Jane, with keep in mind Daniel and his 10 days test and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, James says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. If you jump over to Revelation, which is the next church that we'll be doing, mm-hmm. he says, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison that you may be tested. You will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The crown of life in both of those spots. The There's ten days and the testing. Interesting parallels. Ten days, tribulation, ten days of testing, the crown of life. There's some interesting parallels there for sure. And I was going to say thank you, Angela. Uh, remember what I said a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about starting this book, and that is that some people think that, that this book of James is actually a commentary on Yeshua's Sermon on the Mount. And I don't know if you guys have done any, any looking at that over the last couple of weeks, but I want to encourage you strongly again to read uh, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, because it's all very much tied together. And I, and I don't necessarily know that James is writing a commentary on the, on the Sermon on the Mount. I think he's drawing from it for sure, because there are so many similarities. I mean, just almost word for word, all throughout this whole book of him quoting and riffing off of the ideas that Yeshua played on in uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but I think it's for, it's for good reason that Yeshua knew that great persecution and difficulty was coming upon the world. He said so in multiple occasions. And James is in the midst of it. And it's about to get worse for him. And we are in the midst of also, you know, difficult challenges in the world today. And these Sermon on the Mount, the book of James, these are wonderful, wonderful encouragements 
and guidebooks and instructions on how to behave yourself during a time of great difficulty if you want to be refined and grow and become spiritually stronger and more trusting and more valuable to the kingdom. Great insight. And receive that crown of life. This is it. These are the instructions for how you gain the crown of life. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all I have to share with you. May the Lord himself bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and lift up his countenance toward you and grant you peace. You need peace, all of you. Stop looking at the news. Keep your book open. Read it and pray continuously, especially for each other. Do you have any comments, questions, or concerns? Mm -hmm.